Welcome to Varn Block. No intro music because I forgot to hit the button. And um, I wanted to go ahead and thank a patron, uh, Algorithmith, who became a Kahan Il Kahan, um, a top supporter. And I wanted to thank Algorithmith for that. Um, I just got off watching uh, this revolution's um, debate. Well, d debate's the wrong word. This. Um, Critical discussion between uh, TRI, uh, Cuba, Gene, and Pascal, and to some degree, Jason, who is always the affable host, um, and Danny Besner. And I found myself often torn between Pascal and Danny, who often disagreed. Um, you know, Danny seemed to be uh, responding to the culturalist term by, by stating the culture was given uh, too much importance, which I agree with. Um, but Pascal was insisting quite rightly that that culture is, you know, part of the relations of production and it's the habits, the habits we do both inside and outside of that. And, you know, facile multiculturalism has actually in many ways removed our awareness of how much culture plays into the way we handle and process modes of production. If you believe in ideological theories, it's got to be like part of your your ideological subset, right? Um, there's really no reason around that. And Pascal brought up an interesting thing I've thought about a lot about, you know, national projects and the organic connection of like the old money, the original elites, the, 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 you know, what C. Wright Mill would call the power elites. And we aren't talking about like the PMC. We're talking about the, the wasp owners of the firms and where they all went. And, you know, he brought up that that old money's project has a noblesse oblige. It's almost quasi aristocratic, right? I mean, even though they are the, the, the primogenitors of primitive accumulation within a national project, you know, they're the people who take all the stuff and set up all the rules about taking stuff. Um, that they are often, they often, you know, go decadent as most things do over time usually usually about 100 150 years about three or four generations um and a more naked version of that accumulation comes to bear I mean, and uh because it has no tie to the organic myth of the nation now i think this is interesting because it seems to contradict marxist analysis but it actually it, it doesn't really at all marx doesn't con does it we'll talk about classes in terms of their content in that way? Um, partly because capitalism was pretty was pretty young. I mean, even in England, when Marx is writing, it's at most 120 years old. And partly um, because the broadness of what Marx is trying to describe in abstract is not something that you need to be in a particular instantiation in a national project of capital to see. Um, so, you know, the New England, so you have all these New England provinces, they have, they have Dutch and English names. Um, they are your, your wasp power elite. They, and they dominate the presidency up to and including about Bill Clinton, actually, you know, even like the Bushes are part of that. Um, Barack Obama's white family was part of that. Um, they are the old core of money, but that's going away. What's interesting is, is if you look at the way respectability politics plays out in like the Democratic and Republican parties, is that because of the Republican Party's traditional attachment to like the Sun Belt rich, right? The the bourgeoisie of the of the Sun Belt, as that bourgeoisie is deracinated by a mixture of automation, moving to other countries, and just general economic stagnation and lower profit rates, what you've seen is a like nouveau riche petite bourgeoisie replace it. Um, and the OWASP elite has kind of moved over from the party of the bourgeois to the party of the, of the everything else. I mean... I've always talked about the GOP has historically until very recently been the bourgeois party in America. And the Democrats were like a coalition of early proto-bourgeois, 
uh, financial bourgeois and rentiers, um, planters and quasi aristocratic land forms, and then, you know, various populist coalitions, including, you know, the most radical and progressive movement. But we must remember, like in the early 20th century, the progressive movement was split between both parties. You know, Teddy Roosevelt's actually the founding of the progressive movement, and the progressive movement's also highly tied to imperialism explicitly um, and all its instantiation. When um, Christopher Lash in his early work uses the term neoliberal, he's actually referring to the rebranding of neoliberal, uh, of liberalism done during Fordism. So we're not even talking about the same thing by the progressives. This new, this new liberalism that had adopted traits of the um, socialist, populist, um, and um, various minority nationalist movement to keep them in a liberal coalition, right? And to tie them actually into an explicit imperial project. Now, I, I bring this up. The title of this is actually, you know, not uh, let's talk about Marxist political economy in America. The title of this is deep structures as opposed to like structuralism the way we talk about it in Marxism. Um, the way in which, you know, all that the solid melts in, into air in Marxism, right? The capitalism melts all this out into air, but some of the, just because stuff is melted doesn't mean it's, it's material essence. It's, it's, uh, it's elemental form has gone away. Um, this is a key point, I think, in Marxism, you know, Mar the whole debate over where Marxists believe in human nature, right? Well, in some ways, it's a null point. Like, Marxists do believe in something like, you know, a biological state of, of human being, but that it's so socially mediated at all mm -hmm. times, and it emerged biologically to be so, that you can't speak of it as a constant, consistent thing. Like, human nature varies greatly based on inputs. But there are certain structures that show up over and over again. And one of them is this, you know, I talk about this a lot when I talk about symbolic kinship, right? That, that particularly like people who found societies, they tend to be the power elites for a long time. Since the, the since the nineteen since the end of what we could call like the heroic period of capital, which, which was which is we tend to say is a laissez faire period, but even that's not true. The state had to set up markets, the state had to set up currencies, the state had to stabilize the state was highly involved in this process, but it was more entrepreneurial, less regulatory than what we have now. That lasted up through up into the, the long depression. But the the foundations of American liberalism. Um, with its yeoman and then entrepreneurial branches, um, really begins to decay right before the, right at the end of the Long Depression and comes to the full decadence right during um, the Great Depression. That's when Fordism emerges and Keynesianism emerges as, an, as a response to this. And then that is also when, as that profitability crisis hits, you start seeing... Um, the development of things like neoliberalism. Um, and so neoliberalism as we mean it now, so when, so like when I mentioned when Christopher Lash uses it, you must remember that when he's using that, he's writing in the 60s, neoliberalism as we know it had not really been instantiated in America. It was like a kernel of an idea from a bunch of liberals um, classical liberals in the quotation marks, um, who uh, ha were in Europe, actually almost almost solely Austrian, German, and British. Um, just like the core of the old empire comes to the United States, the core of the old imperial belief system comes to the United States too. But it's important for us to remember that neoliberalism did not actually start in America. Kind of started in the UK, um, which makes sense. It's the oldest capitalist country, and then the next most powerful capitalist country that was not reset by World War II would be the next one in which it would hit and could instantiate it more. But what does this mean about things like I mentioned in my notes today? I'm talking about cleodynamics and other theories of history, other like 
what might be called social physics. And I've been thinking a lot about the social physics problem because on one hand, social physics has been used to generate a whole lot of pseudo knowledge. Um, I mentioned to Esri the other day in a conversation, like you have to be careful with, with applying population truths to individuals. Um, for example, the BMI. You know, the body mass index. It, it, for one, it's science was a little sketchy the entire time. But for two, there are real correlations between BMI and health outcomes. We they're correlative. They're not the causative mechanisms often not understood in every case or in most cases. Um, but. The the BMI way we use it in medicine is based totally off a of statistical average. So we do something with it that it's actually never intended to originally be done with it, which was to apply it to individuals from a, from a population standpoint. Um, so that's a misuse of social physics. We often do this in Marxism too, when we try to like deduce what an individual's response is going to be because of class aggregate truths. All right. But there are some things we do have to look at in our relationships. Like, and, and this is why I was, I found myself split between uh, Danny and um, Pascal today. And I ended up more signing with Pascal than Danny is culture doesn't like, even from the superstructure based metaphor, right? Culture is not just in the superstructure. Relations of production are also cultural. Culture is, the habitats, the habitats, these uh, uh, of words from sociology and anthropology, are the ritual accumulations and habits that you repeat um, in a given society. Yeah, IQ was similar, actually. Although it has more problems. Um, so there is a way in which we have to look at these deeper anthropological structures, like the way in which symbolic kinship really does matter about how a lot of class manifestations, the way class manifests as opposed to just the way it's structured in specific nations actually works. Now the global bourgeoisie is more aligned to each other than, than to their national interest. And um, I think that's always true. I mean, this is why when, when, you know, um, Marxists talk about comprador classes, I'm like, all bourgeoisie eventually become comprador. It's the nature of being bourgeoisie. Um, but there's also a sense in which the origin, the instantiators really do have an almost aristocratic imperative in a direct, um, in a direct, like, uh, relationship Okay, so let me break this down for you guys because a lot of you guys think that base means economic. All right. Um, yes, I do think Besner was overstating his case. Culture relates to production or social life. So wouldn't it be related to the superstructure, I think? No. Culture is both in the superstructure and in the base because relations of production are part of the mode of production. And the mode of production is what determines the base. Relations of production are relations between bosses and non-bosses, the way that the workplace is organized, the way that work gets done. You cannot separate out culture purely in the superstructural apparatus. The cultic part of culture, the ritual habitus of culture, is mostly in the superstructure. But when you try to actually look at the way relations of production are part of the mode of production, which we often break it out. This is something that like the particularly um, the vulgar Stalinist and then actually oddly the GA Cohen analytic Marxist both made this mistake. They bracketed out relations of production entirely and made mode seem like they emerged on their own out of nothing. All right. That they were just imposed as entire structures, whole cloth that they did not come out of the sensuous life of people every day. This is one of my critiques, actually, that I suspect that, that Althusserian structuralism may be guilty of, but there's a couple of times where Althusserian seems to weasel out of it. Yeah. Okay, Frank. So 
So the reproduction of social life is part of the base. Um, relations of production are culturally, uh, culturally mediated. So they're in both they're in both the base and the superstructure. But this is this is why cultural like this is also where I kind of like I agree with what Danny's responding to though. There has been a focus on the left to focus on yeah it, it is a metaphor right there's also that um the relations the relations of production is more important but let's let's actually be completely clear this is something marx is not clear on maybe because of his hegelian base all models are metaphors all models are metaphors all models are metaphors um it's it's yeah, you know, and it's not even a particularly strong metaphor. But the, the and I'm normally focused on people looking at base issues, but I've seen so many people take that as just we talk about economics, and we talk about economics in a bourgeois way. Um, it's not very helpful, particularly in trying to understand like modes of production in prior societies, like how was the Catholic Church. Or how was the Islamic Caliphate important to the production of those societies, right? And the changes in that productive relationship. In fact, uh, Dr. Jean Bajalon, who's in the comment series, is actually specialist in this in regards to the Ottomans, actually affects major changes um, in the entire apparatus of the society. Like, and yeah. So, but we also are still biological beings. And this is the thing that I really want to get into. I've been looking at like, um, are you familiar with modes of accumulation? I am have read a couple of different theories on that. So I'm going to look up and make sure I'm understanding the right one. Oh, the regulate, um, the regulation school theories, right? from um, Bettelheim and the Annal School and those guys. I'm, I am slightly familiar with them, um, but I haven't read uh, Destin de Bernier, um, who I believe is the primary thing. Um, mystification aside, Hegel's arguably better than Marx about how particular uh, manifests in particular cultural context, at least in my reading, it's because he's mostly for, he's mostly interested in ideas. I mean, he thinks ideas are the way God works through the world in that it's negative capacity, and I can go into that. But I man, that's our that's arcane. I spent a whole lot of my life trying to clarify things uh, uh, about Hegel with Zizekian and Lacanian weirdos. Um, who have uh, psychological psychologicalized them and then ontologized their psychology, which that's a bunch of big words for, said that what Hegel was talking about was merely psychological as opposed to uh, ontological, theological, and then said that what their psychology is is actually about ontology. So they do this little loopy loop. Um, as much as I like Zizek, I... I, I think psychoanalysis is a, a proto science at best. Um, anyway, so when you look at the deeper structures of like kinship relations, the way kinship relations are a metaphor that humans use over and over and over again in our societies across multiple modes of production, we can talk about that as a deeper structure of a human being. Right, using it. Yeah, using ideology the way that people justify retroactively is a mistake, but I don't know Yeah. Um so the deeper structure of uh, of human beings does have to way like we have to admit that if we are material beings, that the difference between our the difference between our what is it? Our, our nature versus nurture debates. Like Marx is actually really insightful that he just points out that there isn't that much, like you can't really make it that binary collapses like that. It's a dialectic that almost automatically sublates um, the difference between you and your environment, your, your, even your genetic code has environmental triggers in it. Um, 
environmental access affects both natural and sexual selection. Um, and, you know, if you even think that applies to humans um, at this point, there's just all these things that it really affects. Now, I say this, I don't have a degree in anthropology. I have a degree that is a mixture of anthropology and philosophy. And it's not the degree I really pursued after uni. Um, and the kind of anthropology I was interested in wasn't so much cultural. It was actually, it was physical. I was interested in uh, forensic anthropology um, of the uh, bones and dead things type. Um, and... Uh, but I got into Marshall Sollins and a lot of the, the, uh, um, a lot of the people who did social economic work in anthropology, um, you know, Marshall Sollins wrote the Stone Age economics books and it actually, you know, Stone Age economics describes something that's very close to the, you know, um, classical economic accident, you know, classical economic ideas about primitive communism as opposed to the, quote, state of nature, unquote. So there's that. Um, I've been reading a lot of Peter Turchin, though, because Peter Turchin... Peter Turchin is a Malthusian who then takes the central insight of Marx that Malthusian calculuses don't apply to, quote, modern world. Um, yes, I'm a little familiar with Neil Faulkner. Um, and he draws out a lot of these, uh, um, Um, he draws out all these mathematical rules. Now, if you read his book, Ages of Discord, they're pretty convincing. If you read his book, Ultra Society, they start getting a lot more sloppy. I'm going to do um, the series that we're doing after we finish releasing the series on uh, History of Separation in Volume 4, where Metal Science will be on Ages of Discord and Ultra Society and maybe Secular Cycles by Turchin. Um, we can't just do Marxist stuff all the time. And in fact... Turchin's one of the few um, uh, histor historiographic people who have tried to come up with theories of history that are scientifically modelable um, since the collapse of st structuralism in history. I think I think the the only other place where there's still a lot of historical modeling going on that is re respected in, in history as opposed to the other as opposed to sociology and the other social sciences is world systems theory. Um, so it's it's going to be something that we're going to talk about. One of the things I can tell you, though, right off the bat about Turchin is Turchin methodologically takes national data at face value. So when he talks about, for example, the post-war boom, he doesn't put it in the context of World War II at all. Um, yes, there is a Patreon Discord. For those of you asking, did you if you're a patron and you don't have got it, email uh, message me immediately and I'll get you a thing. If you're not, uh, it's not expensive to be a patron and you get a lot for it, actually. Um, uh, am I visible? The patrons get about three to four the show a week because they get my backlog. Turchin is scientism. We're going to get into to the problems with it later, uh, Gene. But it is an attempt to do something that hasn't been done since Marxism. And I know it makes other I know it makes other historians uncomfortable. Um, but the, you know the the, uh, the national the one of the things that you can just right away see this problem with Turchin is the naturalization of national data. Um. And you're right. He does not interrogate his data. He takes that at face value. Um, and he overpredicts from it, too. And there is also some ways in which, like, he uses vague categories to get his data correctly. Um, how does it, How does Ingalls fare in light of modern anthropology? Well, aside from, like, weird shit he said in uh, notes, like, about Lemuria and other things, um, um, his, actually, his stuff in the family actually seems to mostly hold up it, it, it is not as uh 
the matriarchal stuff doesn't as much. Um, but yeah, yeah, but that's post hoc logic, Gene, to say that some because something turns a white a right wing cocking points that it's bad. Um, Turchin's Turchin's class theory though is is messed up. Um, because Turchin basically believes that there's only elites and counter elites, that there's nothing else um, going on there. So uh, a lot of Ingalls' uh, biological data doesn't it, is not so great. I mean, dialectics of nature is dialectics of nature is probably less wrong than we thought it was. For example, like uh, fifty years ago, but it's still pretty off. Um, Oh, I, I'm vaguely familiar with the theory of communist stuff. How do you get the pitchforks? Um, actually, I, Turchin is not working back from a right-wing PMC thesis because he stated the thesis like 20 years ago, Gene. So um, what I think he's actually doing is something else. But... I effectively just what it works for him. Um I I I think I think ultra society is just a mess. Um the ages of discord and secular cycles I think are interesting. Uh, but I do think there's there's like the elite thesis is really vague. Um Gene, you want to come on the stream because I can send it to you, but I'm not going to make you because you were just on a stream all night. So, can you explain a negative dialectics memes? It was when I read negative dialectics that I started thinking about what identity thinking meant, like what it meant to construct an identity, to identify with an identity, and how that automatically placed you into a matrix of concepts and beings, and relationships. Um, and negative dialectic is a way of looking at that um, in a very uh, um, negative dialectic is a way of looking at that in a very abstract but but essentially negative way. So you cut away, you don't make positive claims. Um, so. All right, so Gene's going to come on, um, which is fine because we can talk more about this. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so um, I'm not going to be. Uh... Hey, Gene, welcome to the second stream tonight. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, let me put on my headphones. Awesome. Good to see you. I drank a bunch of coffee. I'm super psyched. We had a we had a pretty lively uh, show on this is revolution this evening. Yeah, you guys did. Um, it was more contentious than I was thinking, and also didn't talk about foreign policy that much when I listened to of it. I was trying to keep it on track, but we got we got sidetracked with some uh, base superstructure discussion, the cultural term. I think a lot of the disagreement was actually because we were using culture in a very vague way. And we're talking about different things, you know, like soft power versus, you know, ideological superstructure. But it was interesting. So the 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 uh, the consensus of my watchers when I interviewed Danny is that he was very direct. Um, the consensus of your watchers uh, during the show is that it was engaging, but he was smug. So, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, the, the This Is Revolution crowd has a deep suspicion of uh, academics. Uh, they were hassling me for being a, a an up and a recent up and coming conservative, which was like hilarious because I'm like I've been a Marxist and some of you are like in diapers. Um, I'm just old, so <laughs> old, old, old man Vaughn, old man, old man Vaughn. But you gonna do a Turchin's series? Yeah, we're gonna do a series on Turchin and on modal science. And man, you you you're right though. Like Turchin does some some in that book, uh, Ages of Discord. He actually makes a lot of really smart observations, but then like naturalizes things. Like, for example, one of the things that he does because of the way he uses data, 
he says that you know um the 40s through the 70s are the only true social democratic period in america um but leaves out the cause of the post-war prosperity being the war like he mm. just doesn't t- mention it at all um so th- that it's stuff like that, that that bugged me about him because he had like after reading so much marxist like we can general like i've been reading in notes lately and i love in notes but the way they fucking write and make generalizations with with no mathematical or historical like specific context is maddening it's absolutely fucking maddening and you know what's interesting is like beninev and burns who are both you know part of that collective they don't do that as individuals so i think it's like part of the process of the editorializing so we all shaved off our beards huh mine was an accident Uh i got a bit too enthusiastic with the shaver and it just came off and so i was like well i can't go on with like half a beard I have to just go whole hog. So, uh, I'm. Uh, can I announce what you and I are going to be doing together regularly on this channel and on TIR? Heck yeah, of course. Um, Gene and I are going to be doing a monthly show for both Var and Blog and This Is Revolution uh, streams, um, and it, I'd probably be released uh, as audio for both of you. Um, we're going to be doing a gaming show about the uh, about the political economy of tabletop RPGs and other stuff. Yeah, it should be fun. We'll be talking. To, we're going to do a first episode on Dungeons and Dragons. Then we're going to tackle the OSR, and then then we're going to ti- tackle the Titan in the room, which is the capitalist monopoly that is Games Workshop. And I have a lot of thoughts on Games Workshop and its conservative game design theory, which I think demonstrates the problems with having a monopoly on space marines so, so it's, conservative game design theory and crypto fascist worldview um yeah it's an ironic crypto fascist worldview it was originally a satire but as so many things in science fiction are uh, transformed from like dystopian futures into like people getting super hard-ons about like you know like cyberpunk was a dystopia but now if you talk to kiddos, they're like, cyberpunk world would be so cool if you could be a cyberpunk. And it's like, it probably wouldn't be really cool. You know, it probably suck really bad to live in, you know, ecologically collapsed cyberpunk world. So all these dystopias are becoming utopias in our dystopic present. <sighs> Much ado about Trump memes. So uh, it's actually interesting that you came on because this topic is near and dear to your heart because you and I have talked off air and i'm gonna have you come on formally you know one of my not well shout out to jim is that jim is that jim from springfield uh, jim davis in the chat you know jim jim has been like a, a, a someone i've known around jim's a legend in springfield man he's like the og og leftist man in, in springfield you gotta like uh he's uh he's forever young but um yeah. yeah, it's it's OG. It's OG. I haven't seen Jim for ages. I think I think I ran into Jim in the game shop actually the last time I saw him. But yeah, he's the he's like the father of leftism in Springfield. I would say. Hmm. Um. Someone asked us how much do they have to pay for us to do Varg's racist RPG. <laughs> uh. What is that? Is that Mortbok? No. Oh. No, Mortbok's not racist, is it? I hope I not. I don't know, man. Like, I just like. I don't know. Uh, there's uh, there's that R- RPG pundit guy. That guy seems pretty sketch. RPG pundit? I don't know that guy, man. There was a, there was a guy who did Warhammer videos who got sued uh, by Games Workshop because he called himself Warhammer Arch. But he was like a he's like a Norwegian Nazi or something like that. It's like really, it's really messed up. So um. Uh, I was just going to preview that you were going to come on and talk to us about uh, the the insanity that is um, understanding the political economy of the Ottoman Empire. And, yeah. And, you know, I'm going to get you on for that. But do you want to uh, – that's another thing that, you know, Gene and I talk about because we're both interested in Middle Eastern history. Um, uh, a lot of people think, um, for example – Somebody today, uh, I was on, God, I, I've been so on the computer today because um, I was on a show with um, Freddie DeBoer and J.G. Michaels today talking about Ruby Ridge, which was weird. Um, 
it's a weird thing. Talking about Ruby Ridge, uh, because Biden's gearing up all that domestic terrorism stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, we'll cover a lot of stuff, guys. It, it'll come up as it comes up. Um, so, but uh, anyway, uh, JG was asking me about how I felt, you know, because he was like, well, you know, don't aren't you one of those leftists who thinks political Islam is actually a threat? And I was like, not in the West, yeah, but, I know. but it is kind of a threat if you're in the Middle East and you're a leftist. Um, it's the threat in the Middle East. Like uh, movements from political Islam are coming out of political Islam in the last, what, since the 80s have been the primary uh, liquidator of the political left. That's just a fact. You look at Turkey, you look at Iran. Uh, I mean, Saddam Hussein, he did the left in in Iraq. But, you know, by and large, in a lot of countries, it's fucking Islamists who do it. Mm -hmm. But, of course, the notion that Islamists are going to take over, like, London, is just like... It's just ludicrous. It's ludicrous, absolutely yeah. ludicrous. It's like they're going to establish a caliphate in London like Hespiteria used to want to do. That's bullshit. So like, um, but the funny only off, there's like the, the, I mean, in France, they have this whole conspiracy theory of islamo Gushis, the like Islamist left alliance, which, right, which basically led to a novel. So, <laughs> But there are elements on the Western left that like completely cannot conceptualize what political Islam is and a lot of them are in Britain. Yeah, a lot of them. Are, well, like even here, like people, you know, people will like uh, shift from like critiquing American imperialism towards Iran and like the brutalization of the Iranian population by the sanctions regime that's imposed on the country to like fawning praise for the Islamic Republic as a kind of Islam, uh, as a kind of socialist paradise. And insofar as like, you know, basically after the Iran Iraq war, like a lot of the left wing of the Islamic movement, the kind of Marxian Islamist uh, synthesis people, they were purged and you ended up having like a, uh, a, a cap, like a, like basically a big shift towards uh, capitalism and ultimately, you know, neoliberalism insofar as like any kind of status politics exists still in iran it's usually for national security reasons and not orientated toward any kind of like um you know socialist politics so like people are just super bad at understanding the islamists have you been accused of being a saudi intelligence agent for what you just said oh that's a good point uh <laughs> well uh you know, the Saudis, they have a nationalized oil company, as uh, Cooper pointed out today. You know, so, like, they must be socialist. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember in Britain, I, I had some friends go, you know, start buying into the left, the the left Islamist conspiracy theories in Britain um, when I was in the, when I was actually in Egypt. And, um, but I do remember, like, Galway in particular sounding just absolutely uh baddie about it like just in utter denial yeah i mean right. Ga galloway though is like he's a bad faith actor and and you know insofar as red browners exist like galloway is like hooked up with all kinds of like dodgy english nationalist group because he now has his like workers party or whatever it's called the british workers party so he's like a big he's like big into that kind of like he, like he's really gone fucking nuts on um He's gone like nuts on the Brexit thing. He's like, he's very much like a British nationalist on in some weird ways. But also like he had a freaking show, I think on press TV. So he was like taking Iranian dollars. So, and not that, not that I, I think like, it's just there's a whole load of things which should ring bells about George Galloway. One thing I do appreciate about George Galloway was that he did used to like have a call in radio show where he would like get Scottish nationalists to call in and basically make fun of how stupid Scottish nationalism is and how like the Scots pretending that they were an oppressed nation in the British Empire is just an absolute fabrication. So I did enjoy him when he did that, but 
He's a so, problem. Man. So you you are against my uh, my Scotch Irish ancestors. Um, I have no uh, Scotch Irish are the most pro British people shush. in the <laughs> union. They're like more British than the British. They, they like Britain will be ended, and the only people who will still call themselves British will be the Scotch Irish. You're probably correct. Um, uh, my half my family half my family is Ulster Catholic, historically speaking. So, and the oh. other half is like Bulgarian Jews, and That's and Stuarts from Scotland. So quite an oppressed melange you have there. You know, Ulster like, Catholics, yeah. Ulster, Ulster Catholics with Bulgarian Jews with. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's like not it's 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 being off white. And white trash landia. Um, so um, it's interesting though. I, I, I think it was uh, Pascal's point I was talking about that I did think was important tonight was the the relationship of like the est establishment um, groups of a nation and the national project. And like, you know, the way that kind of plays out with Mao, the way it played out. Well, it would have played out with the old Bolsheviks if the old Bolsheviks hadn't all been killed. Um, well, they obviously had it coming, Derek. Um, you know. Um. Well, I no, I totally agree with. Uh, I totally agree with. Like, this is what uh, I, you know. Like, that was a point which I thought was a really good one by Pascal, but not usually one that he makes, in the sense that he's usually, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but he's usually arguing for the utter cynicism of the ruling class. Um, but then I think the point he was making was very nuanced in that, you know, like the sociological relationship to people, to the national project, and by and large, that usually means to the state, I think really does affect them, you know, ideal. There's a book on Turkey, something, I forget the name, God damn it. But it's like class solidarity, but it's literally about people who were in the same class in the late Ottoman period. And then they became the like ruling elite of the Republic. And even though they were like, if you went to a small town Turkish, a small Turkish town, even though the local merchants would be richer than the Kamalist bureaucrats, the Kamalist bureaucrats would have like a higher social prestige and they would dress in Western uh, clothing versus like the Eastern, you know, um, you know, traditional Turkish garb. And um, that status was very important in the execution of policy, in terms of how, when people can't understand why elites are sometimes really bad at self-preservation, it's because the they get trapped by their own ideology, right? You know, like ideology matters in that sense, in that they, um, they, they, what is it? What do you say in America? They they uh, sniff their own farts, right? Or they, yeah, you know, they 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 start getting high on their own supply. But there's an interesting theory like that I've been running through about, about that I do think is kind of a generational cycle thing. In most societies, you got two generations of people who are cynical. And by the third generation of leaders, they believe their own Kool-Aid. Like you think about Cold War bullshit, like 1919 people through Wilson, they really believe in the threat of the, the Bolsheviks, not because of it's an external threat, because it's an internal threat. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but as an external threat, there's no way that Truman and Eisenhower, and we know that Eisenhower at least, really believed it. But JFK actually fucking did. Like, everything you read, JFK thought it was optics, but he really, he really thought that there was a real war to be fought um, with the USSR over hearts and minds. And that, that hearts and minds war was also one that involved bullets. Yeah, I mean, I to I, I, yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. I, I think, uh, I think one of the points Bestner was making tonight, which I think is a fair one, is that the ability of you to you a lot of what we call soft power and hearts and mind is kind of just bullshit and institutions getting high on their own supply and not actually doing much on the ground, right? Yeah, I think that's. I think that's true. I mean, I think part of the issue that you, that was being had is Besner's focusing on geopolitics and Pascal is focusing on intra nation politics. And I do think there's actually a pretty significant difference there. Mm -hmm. Like hearts and mind, uh, soft power, mm -hmm. our hearts and minds influence, our hegemonic influence on another nation 
it does have an effect as far as like markets and stuff go. It has a pretty profound effect of uh, political economy, but like, you know, does it change people's, you know, you know, fundamental consciousness towards the state? I highly doubt it. Well, it also comes down to you can, people can all like in Iran, people can all start wearing like blue jeans and t-shirts and listening to Western style music, but then they all swing and support the Ayatollah at the end of the day when he comes back. Right. So like, mm -hmm affecting kind of superficial cultural changes doesn't necessarily mean that those cultural changes will transfer into political gains for the United States. It's perfectly possible to enjoy many aspects of American culture, as we all do, while not liking the American state. Um, oh, for sure. Uh, I would maybe even go further than that. I mean, like, when I think about how many people I knew when I was abroad who like hated the American state and not just like the American, not just like necessarily uh, had like love affair with parts of American culture. Um, often they had no problem with Americans either. I mean, it was usually like when I've encountered like individualized anti-Americanism down to a person, it's either been in South Korea or it's been in Europe. It hasn't been in like Latin America or the Middle East, actually, um, mm. which is an interesting thing. And, that, and those people, you know, I'm talking about people who would tell me how much they hated my country, like to my face. Sure. Like, yeah, people have a really complicated relationship with the United States. You know, the United States does put out an enormous amount of cult culture uh, in a very broad sense, uh, and also a lot of uh, sends a lot of different contradictory messages through. The export of American culture, and people have weird relations to it, right? Mm -hmm. People people love American music, right? Mm -hmm. Buying into that, yeah. Like there are very few people who utterly reject Americanism. I mean, it, usually when that when it when people try to utterly reject Americanism culturally, it's uh, kind of an extremist project, even within a society, not just a nationalist one, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and even when you do have, yeah, and nationalist projects usually oftentimes ape American culture, for, but in the service of the nationalist project, like the, the, the what's the mo Chinese movie, The Wolf Warrior, uh, like you have a Rambo movie, it's just with the Chinese guy, but it's in a Western style and art form. It's um, but I I mean I think that I think I think uh, to get to the meta issue, which is the base uh, uh the base superstructure metaphor, uh, I do think there's like a, a really interesting discussion to have on causality, and I guess my position on it would be. I. I see, the, base, it, not you know relations of production the structures. Of society, while stable, to, there tends to be a very limited effect that sort of cultural activity can take place. But at, at times of crisis, culture and like individual as agency very much matters. Um, I mean, I think that's somewhat. I would hope that was obvious. It w one of the things that I that I responded to both sides of uh, of the debate was the ideas around power in academia, um, because on one hand I agree with, I mean, all of us are to some degrees products of academia. I am the least prestigiously educated of anyone on that show, other than maybe Jason. Um, I don't know Jason's educational background, and I don't ask, but. Um, you know, you're a fucking Oxford PMC bloke. Um, Cuba's Ivy. Pascal's a lawyer. Um, uh, Danny's Ivy too, I believe. Um, there is a sense, though, that I I do think that we that there was a bit of um, on one hand a bit to overstating the conspiracy theory about like say trying to directly control. Uh, you know, the humanities, particularly when most of the money was actually going into STEM and R&D development. Um, but there there was actually a cultural Cold War that was absolutely real, um, where the OSS was actually deliberately funding stuff. 
um, for all sides, so actually on all sides often, you know, um, it, and it was continued under the CAA until the, the middle 60s. Um, you can read the books on, a, you know, the cultural Cold War. Lash mentions it in The Agony of the American Left. So it was kind of an open secret even in the 60s because he, you know, he was like he couldn't prove that the Congress on Cultural Freedom was funded by the CIA, but they were always around the CIA. So we figured they must have been like James Burnham was just always mysteriously there. Um, you know, but on the other hand, I don't think there's like a secret of a cabal, the government being like, you know, telling like, I don't know, the the Gates, the Gates Foundation, who to fund. Um, and that everyone should read Edward Said and Foucault rather right. than but I do think we have to, we, we do have to, Foucault is an interesting problem, but, um, because that was the one where I was like, well, we, like, I think you're bracketing out the fact that the French communist party really fucked up because all these people were originally members of it and they all became something else. Um, but I also think you do have to account for the fact that Derrida had money to go to Stanford. That was sure. not, you know, but it's, it's, um, so, like, my point would be this. Like, first, like, I think people don't realize how academia works, right? Just like a lot of the left don't know how a lot of structures of power work. And at the very least, you know, like, the attempts to influence institutions, especially kind of like institutions like academia, which are more peripheral than, let's say, the think tank world or, or places like that, or much more sort of peripheral. And also there's, uh, you know, like the, the the hand of the state is certainly there in terms of what it funds, what kind of th things uh, are funded. But very often the money trickles down through a multiplicity of different le le levels. And often it will go to weird things, right? Um, so like, yes, perhaps we can talk about like a guiding hand, uh, but also I think more important than the guiding hand in shaping, for example, the cultural term in academia is the failure of the Soviet Union and the political left, right? Right. Uh, you know, so, you know, there's only, you know, there's only so much you can, like, open, like, you can push academia in a particular direction. Um, you know, there's all kinds of, like, social... Uh, you know, the sociology of, of a academia was changing in the 60s and 70s. But the failure of the political left and the, the, the kind of, by the 80s, the Soviet Union did not look like uh, a serious alternative. Uh, and to, honestly, neither did China at the time either. So Yeah, so, so basically, I think a lot of people of their own volition, you know, without any particularly direct prompting from the state authorities, came to reject like the traditional Marxist narratives, right? Because it was seen to have like failed and this went into overdrive in the 1990s, right? And that was not a, a conspiracy. That was just like the ideological zeitgeist of the time. Right, I mean, the other thing that I, that I think gets a little bit muddled um, is the difference between private actors doing some of this stuff in the state making it policy. Um, and so when I mentioned the OSS stuff, it's interesting that that kind of really stops in the 60s because it doesn't seem like it's that effective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly when like you, you have stuff uh, almost like the way they talk about like w the way liberals talk about Russians now, you know, um, where you have people funded by the CIA fighting groups of people also taking CIA money within the United States. Like you would have like modernists who are getting CIA money to, to kind of, to kind of promote, you know, a kind of abstract art that was highly depoliticized um, being protested by anti-communists who are also getting CIA money. Yeah. I mean, it's like a whole fucking, uh, it's a big mess. Like I think people really have to sort of, break their notion that the a the and this was something both daniel and kuba brought up break the notion that the state is a unitary actor right mm -hmm. number one break the idea that you know the entire of the ruling class is pulling in the same direction 
uh, and that factional fights within the ruling class are like kabuki theater. Sometimes they are like real concrete class. Uh, there are real factional fights based on sectoral interests or based on this, that, and the other uh, that take place, which means we're never really dealing with a fully coherent state policy. And so the outcome, you know, like, and, and the third thing about academia, when we talk about academia, you don't have to pay everybody to in like a conspiratorial way if most people in our academia come from a particular social class, right? And they mostly do. And yeah. they mostly do. Like, uh, and, and it's reverting to the way that it used to be. If I talk to a student these days and they're like, I want to be a college professor, I'm like, look, you can you can try, but like the best way to become a college professor these days is to be independently wealthy so you can sustain, you know, Ten, seven years of a PhD and then like five, six years of underemployment. And so, yeah, like the class orientation of academia. I mean, it's not an accident that like academia to, to a certain degree radicalized in the 60s and 70s when there were like more opportunities from people from like different backgrounds, right? Yeah, there's there's a lot going into that, though. I mean, part of it is I guess maybe this is where I'd come back into the anti-Gramscian because, uh, you know, the long march to the institutions was there was this uh, window of opportunity through the GI Bill and other things um, to get working class people in and radicals in. But what it has mostly done is actually de-radicalize those people. Like a lot of those people are basically the the intellectual think tank of the Democratic Party, just like, frankly, you know, most of the Frankfurt School after Horkheimer are kind of the, 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 um, the like Habermas is kind of the, the philosopher prince of the EU. You know, it's true. Like, um, so it's not even unique to the United States at all. Um, it was interesting though. You want to talk about the fracturing, not just of like academia and the way the government works. It's also true in other things. Uh, one of the things we were talking about and the Ruby Ridge thing, uh, which JD about JD will release, was how different agencies, different federal law enforcement agencies, had radically different agendas mm -hmm. and and ideas about use of force in regards to the situation in Idaho. Um, and the, the ATF was basically the way we associate ATF in the nineties was the way we associate with the border, the border patrol. Now that they were basically deliberately used as goons. Um, and th this actually created tensions within the federal law enforcement, uh, apparatus, um, which kind of led to the, 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 interestingly enough, the, 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 the peaceable ones are the ones that probably liberals and leftists today would be mad at, but they were, they were afraid that a, a vote use of force would not only, you know, make a confrontation inevitable when you're dealing with people who literally have an apocalyptic belief system, mm -hmm. but would lead to blowback. And it's amazing to me that people can look at blowback and foreign policy, but not look at it domestically at all. Well, um, it's, it's, it's like people, you know, like people think, that like the United States military, right, is sitting there in West Point teaching people like this is how you go murder brown people, right? You know, like the job of the United States military is to murder brown people. We love murdering brown, brown people. Now, of course, there's a, there is racism within the United States uh, military, but within the officer cadre, there's actually quite a strong like political ethos, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was in Iraq, it was very clear, this is 2004, the first time I went there, the ethos of the United States military and its relationship with the Iraqi civilians was radically different from the ethos of the private contractors who went out there. So, you know, like the, 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 the Americans, obviously the exercise of American uh, military power is like, disastrous for like regular people especially the air power but like the notion that the american military was like going out there deliberately terrorizing civilians just isn't borne out by what the united states was doing and a lot of the dirty work of the war was actually done by uh, private contractors which pissed off 
the United States military, which was like, A, we're doing all this like bullshit, like community relations building one day, these contractors come and cause all kinds of trouble the next day. And then we get blown up by an IED because Iraqis don't give a shit about, you can fucking tell Iraqis that, oh, these are contractors and these are US soldiers. Doesn't make a fucking difference. Now in the grand scheme of things, the occupation is brutal. But, you know, it's also driven by an internal dynamic between the different agencies of the United States and how they want to, like, exercise power. And I think, you know, it's not a moral question about, like, one is better than the other. But if we want to understand how power is exercised and, func uh, and, and, and functions, you know, how policy is executed, we need to, like, take seriously, like, the way political power is fractured. And what I think, you know, uh, the way it's fractured the rivalries between different wings of the state and the, and the incoherency very often of the ruling class and, and state apparatus, especially in America, which is a highly messed up state. Yeah. I mean, would you like to talk about what, like what makes America uniquely kind of hard to understand from an, ex from an outsider's point of view, as far as like its state functions go? Well, I mean, mm -hmm. I know part of it, it's, 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 it's federations are we like, we both have a lot of executive power and no executive power in a way that's mm -hmm. actually quite weird. Um, but is there anything else about the, the nature of the state that you find odd? Uh, about the United States in particular? Yeah. I mean, I would definitely say, uh, well, it's because America is like most representative, like functioning bourgeois democracies, right? Like developed bourgeois democracies are in relatively limited nation states, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and often those like relatively limited sized nation states have actually quite a bit of cultural diversity in them, especially over like very small, you know, like territorial regions, right? You know, you've got a tiny country like Switzerland, but you have three different, four different languages spoken there. Right, right, right. Uh, in America, you have like a, on one level, you have like a very homogeneous like national culture to a certain extent. You have certain groups that have been excluded, African-Americans, Latinos. You have, like, ethnics who get assimilated after a generation or two. So American nationalism is, like, super – it is very protean in that it, it, can be, it can be bought into by a lot of different people in, in a way that, let's say, British or French nationalism isn't, mm. which I find a kind of interesting aspect of the American state. And one of the really weird things, I guess it's not the American state, but American political culture is like the absolute hegemony. Or like not absolute, but like the the enormously the enormous influence of libertarian like ideology on the American people. Part like, particularly at the state level. I like not, I mean yeah, at the national level, but not it, it's it's different. It's insane. It's like this, like libertarianism is the ultimate getting high on your own supply uh, ideology because it's like it's destructive for their own, you know, for America's national interest. Libertarianism is like disastrous. Uh, and I don't see like in Britain, in, even in Britain, like the conservatives can do a little bit of that, like national conservatism as opposed to libertarian. Republicans are like almost like incapable, even when they talk the talk of like national conservatism or in practice it's just fucking libertarian bullshit. It's bonkers, man. America's a very weird country. Hmm. It's like what kind of country, like what kind of advanced country doesn't have universal health care? It's like beggar's belief. And yet it's so naturalized in, in America. You can go to Turkey and you can get fucking you can go to Iraq and you can get to take it to a hospital and you won't have to pay. Won't be a great hospital. But it'll be a hospital <laughs> that you won't have to pay for. And as long as you don't have something like super complex, it doesn't matter. If you break your arm, they can fucking handle it at an Iraqi hospital. It's interesting because I... It's interesting because I've also lived in places that have no insurance schema whatsoever, including any social insurance like, like Egypt. Um, and it also works better than what we do. Because the United States system, not just it's not just that we don't have a national health care service or anything like that, or even like a single payer service, which is what like most of Asia has. Um, 
we have a very weird healthcare system because it also isn't a market in any traditional sense of the word. You have no knowledge of prices until after the fact. Prices can be changed up until morning billing. You can charge different people different things arbitrarily, which you can't legally do anything and any other thing. Um, it's it's actually kind of wild. It it has. I was arguing with someone, you know, the other day where I was like, it barely even meets any definition of capitalism, and yet. We defend it because it's free market healthcare, whatever that means. I mean, the for true free market deal would be, you know, nobody gets healthcare unless you can pay for it, right? And, uh, and which hospital. it is, which is what it had in Egypt. It was either it was either, uh, you know, Islamicate charity hospitals, or it was uh, you had to pay for it up front, and they didn't take insurance. Well, it's the most the American healthcare system is the most American thing. Ever, it's like a highly re re regulated, inefficient bureaucracy. Yes, which allows private companies to arbitrage a shit ton of money. Like that's that's, that's what. That's part of why we can't get rid of it. Yeah, because it's like how many how many jobs will be lost? And I'm not talking about nurses or doctors here. A be and with, as soon as you nationalize it, it's not just the insurance companies. I mean, like whole wings of hospitals will go away. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, but you know, like that's, yeah, it's that there's like a huge vested interest in maintaining that system, even though it's ineffective. What would you, I mean, the best hope for America in terms of getting nationalized healthcare is that a significant portion of, uh, like capitalist firms and companies like decide we don't want to fucking pay health insurance anymore and we want to nationalize health, health insurance. I thought but, that might happen with the fit with the auto failure in 2008 actually. Yeah, I think like I think what um I think what happens is I think a lot of these companies though even if it might be beneficial for them to have nationalized healthcare don't want to obviously concede the principle as that as they're so paranoid by about any kind of like big scary state intervention into so you know it comes down to the ideology again right like it would be in their material it would be in the material interest of like large sections of the american business population to have like not have to pay for health care for their workers right mm -hmm. to, to like dump that off on the on the state which pays for it through borrowing printing money or whatever it does right but like ideologically they're like terrified like and i don't think nationalized healthcare would lead to further nationalizations I think I think many people can like perfectly rationalize having like nationalized healthcare, but who would be v viciously opposed to any, uh, you know, any other kind of nationalization. But they would make an exception for healthcare. But I think there's a paranoia amongst, uh, driven by like the deep anti-socialism, uh, like like the utter paranoia about any kind of inverted commas collectivism, which just like hampers any progress towards medicare for all which is helped by the fact that all the motherfuckers making the decision have good health care mm -hmm. i mean it's uh yeah i don't know it's it, it's tough i mean there there are other things that i would i would say about that because um the more i'm looking at profitability crisis i think like everybody's having one and i don't think like everything involved in this is politically determined but um, I do think actually you're absolutely right, because if you just look at like the cost ratios, if like almost every country with socialized medicine actually spends less governmental money, I'm not even talking about private money here, mm -hmm. governmental money on healthcare than we do. I mean, there's, there's basically a backdoor pipeline for like all kinds of grift going on. Um, as similar with education, I mean, you know, but similar it, with the military. But I also think uh, that a lot of the left in America has put way too much stock in these programs as the way to socialism. Because I think actually, you're right; it wouldn't lead to further nationalizations. It wouldn't even need lead to necessarily more workers' rights. It's like a minimum thing, and it would take a lot of the air out of people at the DSA because this is literally the only policy plank they actually have. And right. you know, I kind of like, yeah. I mean, like, but I have kind There's of not a reason to oppose it. I'm just saying. No, but I have sympathy for the notion. Like, 
there's a lot of big talk on the U.S. Uh, on the U.S. left. You know, you have all this like cosplay revolutionary bullshit. You know, taking place, and it's like, bro, like you aren't gonna storm the commanding heights of socialism and like reach the summit of communist paradise when you can't eat. You don't can't muster enough strength to force the American bourgeoisie and the American bourgeoisie to concede like basic fucking social democracy that in reactionary old Britain they got in 1945, right? It's actually probably, I mean, to be fair, it would have been easier to get it in America in 1945 than America. sure Sure as hell would have. I totally agree. I totally agree. It would have been, a lot of been, uh, uh, but the left is so fucking weak now in America and the state is so captured. I mean, we've discussed this off air before, you know, like, mm -hmm. The, the Chinese state is not like this magical thing that it's like completely autonomous from economic structures. Yeah. But but they do have a fucking ability to like they can tell firms what they do. They they're can tell still firms. Drop, they're still gonna drop their interest rate to placate capital as a whole. A whole yes. But they, they, they can buff, they can shoot Jack Ma on head. Like yeah, they, they they yeah, they can they they can they can shoot a certain number of billionaires in the head. To intimidate the others, but they wouldn't dare drag all the billionaires out and shoot them all in the head at the same time. The so you know, like, but the American state, like, the total, you know, executive. What is it? Uh, executive committee for the collective management of the affairs of the bourgeoisie. I forget the precise quote, but uh, you know, it is literally the definition of a state that is under that that like completely lacks uh any autonomy and insofar that there's like conflict uh it, it, insofar there's this factionism in the state it's driven by different factions of the american ruling class which have different sectoral interests or what have you yeah i mean what, what's fascinating about that National land reform. That's right. That's what I want to see. Fucking peasants uprising. I want to see the fucking... Uh, yeah, Americans don't even have land reform, man. But they, well, Amer neither did the British, to be fair. But... No, but the British had the First World War, which meant that, like, most of the landed states were broken up because of the tax. But that's a different question. That's true, although you're, the richest man in Britain is still is still a few uh, of It's true. Um, so, I mean... I, I, but you know, we never had land reform. I mean, I, our land reform was basically westward expansion land grabs, frankly. Um, which is also why we never had to have it. I mean, if we're completely honest, like when you when you when you're buying land from French settler colonialists and then taking land from Spanish settler colonialists turned Mexicans, um, it's you. And then you know depopulating the the indigenous people there entirely. You don't really have to have land reform because you're just parceling out land that you took. But the, uh, and where you did need land reform, the peasantry didn't like to be called peasantry, which is the South. Like the South, you had like a, a traditional European style peasantry, more or less, right? Right, and they you turned know. into sharecroppers, which was this weird hybrid quasi peasant thing until like the middle of the 20th century. Yeah, and they were yeah they they didn't obviously didn't have like the existence of actual feudal mechanisms only like there were a couple of cases I guess in New England, but like by and large those kind of like legal structures didn't exist. But the ultimately like a kind of like uh, feudalism uh, backed by de jure rather uh, uh, by um, de facto rather than de jure like uh, legal power um, existed in the South, but the excess energy of the peasantry in the South could be directed out to like, as you say, to like homesteading on native American land. Right. Or, you know, into a stupid war that just grind up most of the non planter class or into weird filibustering land grabs where they tried to pull a Texas and, and failed and, failed and Sonora and Nicaragua and, and, uh, you know, they kept on using the Monroe Doctrine. We're going to go fight the European imperialists, but also we're going to stay. And rule. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like a, America is like a very weird country. It's like a country built on anti-imperialism, which is the most also simultaneously from its inception has been an imperial project. The anti-imperial empire. 
yeah from the anti moment one. Yeah. from moment one because you know like there's a lot of this talk about this like slavery uh was the cause of the civil uh of, of the uh, war of independence which i'm kind of skeptical like that the american elite was like super worried that the british were on the verge of abolishing slavery right a they weren't and b in so much that it was accelerated it was kind of to piss off the americans, americans. <laughs> the real the real argument to be made if you ask me is all those historians who make the argument that it was the british's attempt to close settlement across the appalachian mountains that was critical yeah you know like that is a far you, you know so it was like a clash and this is where like i don't agree with gerald horn all the time i think uh Pascal thinks that Gerald Horn is actually scared of white people, and that's why he writes the way that he he does. But um, uh, yeah, I've I got off about Gerald Horn a couple of times, but go I ahead. don't I don't believe in Gerald Horn's like the American Revolution was inherently reactionary from the get go. But I do think his comparison to the uh, be between the American Revolution and like. Algeria and Rhodesia is like a, a legitimate, I think it's, uh, I a very it's fair, totally it's legit. a very, it's a very fair comparison to be made. And apparently like Gerald Horn actually in the American context. So, I mean, it's like, it's, he seems to be selective on what he's talking about in what book. Um, uh, but I mean, the, the, one of the things about America is like, we, the U.S. had a, a peasantry, which was, you know, sharecroppers um, who were who were peasant aristocrats, basically, and slaves, and then sharecroppers, white, and then even shittier sharecroppers who were former slaves, which is actually a similar structure to Rhodesia. Like it, it totally is the Rhodesian system, um, which, particularly when they didn't have formal slavery, had still this like institutionalized, like we 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 treat the whites like shit but we treat the blacks much worse and mm -hmm. that keeps the whites in line and keeps the blacks suppressed. And it's, it was kind of an effective strategy, unfortunately. I mean, for a long yeah. time. I mean, this is, this, this comes down to like, um, you know, like capitalism is racialized, not because like in the abstract capitalism has to be racialized, but because capitalism exists in the real world and the maintenance of the capitalist system requires racialization or ethnicization to a certain degree in order to maintain itself this is why woke capitalism is fucking getting high on your own supply because like if you like if you are like a, if you if you try to do woke capitalism you'll get a backlash right because that tw top tw like if the top 20 percent is disproportionately white and you want to make it like equal then the people who are going to fall out of the top 20% are not going to want to fucking fall out of the top 20%. And they're going to like, which want we to, see in the Republican party, basically. which we see in the Republican party. Right. So if you fail, you get a backlash and you end up with a fucking worse than before. And if you succeed, you like eliminate one of the key obstacles to the formation of working class solidarity, which is the, the actual concrete salience of race and ethnicity not like you because it fucking matters right it matters it doesn't matter in any kind of like you know esoteric sense or like there's some essential difference between black and white people but it matters because it controls your access to opportunity and resources it's like in iraq like when i was working in iraq right i was working in american university of iraq People would fucking come to me and they would look, they'd be looking for a quote. They wanted to find an academic who could give them a quote. And they would come to me. And when they wanted to talk about sectarianism in Iraq, they wanted to talk about like, what about, you know, like this like long running rivalry since the Battle of Karbala? I'm like, look, motherfuckers aren't killing himself, killing each other in the streets of Baghdad and Basra and Samara uh, and Mosul because, you know, uh, because the prophet Ali, like, uh, because because uh, what's his name? Hussein was, Hussein was martyred at, uh, at Karbala, like, fourteen hundred years ago. People aren't like mo people are mobilizing because your membership of a sectarian group dictates your access to resources. Right? It's reified in like in Lebanon. It's reified through like actual legal consociational structures. Right? In the United States you know, to a certain degree, 
that is the case with like affirmative action or what have you, blah, 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 blah. Or like white supremacy, like redlining and things like that. Your race matters because it dictates your, the, if you fucking obliterate those kind of like divisions between people, that's like, that would be, woke capitalism would be digging its own grave in a far more effective way than uh, like woke capitalism, I, I firmly believe is less sustainable than like racialized capitalism. That would be my point. I would, we will, we will see. I, because I think we're going to get woke capitalism because I think racial, because the simple demographics of racialized capitalism in America are going to be hard to maintain. Um, unless, you can, unless you can expand whiteness really fast to a whole lot of groups. Um, so it's, which is possible, but that has not been the way that things have been going. I think, you know, I think, um, I think to a certain degree, the reaction against woke capitalism will not be like a reconstruction, or like a revival of the old black, white racial divisions. I think you're going to have new axes of like belonging. I think and you're going to have global internationalism versus versus multi-ethnic nationalism. Like yeah. with, with integralism actually you know the old the old non-racial fascism before fourth positionism right like people don't know this but like catholic integralism was just like yeah we're all catholics we're all a nation it doesn't matter our racial origin that was the fascist pull in brazil for the exact same reason actually because the whites were a minority and this um, is what you're going to see stuff like this ados that pascal's always talking about the descendants of the um, african-americans so those guys are fucking primed to be part of a new we could even call it woke fascism, right? A, a woke fascism which orientates it around itself around like almost ethnicized political division, you know, like where being a, a liberal becomes like anti-national, right? And then mm -hmm. certain like groups which are gu gru uh, viewed as outside of the nation, right? So I think we're going to see like, I think we're going to see like, I think like, so... I don't know if you know if you were uh, caught this on the show, but Pascal and uh, Daniel Bessner had a little debate over fascism. Yeah, I did catch that. Which I, the I, I was more reading the comments and kind of rolling my eyes. Actually, this was where the only time I disliked the commentary is like none of you have a good definition of fascism. Like not one well, of you. I like <laughs> I like I find that b b debate to be honestly like kind of boring and misleading. Because it's frankly. it's be, it's because like depending on which definition of fascism you use, Trumpism can be fascism or it, it may not be fascism. What it certainly is is not a redux of like. Um, it's not Hitlerism. It's not Mussolini fascism. It's, it's something yeah. else. Like, and that and that ideology doesn't exist today. But I do think that there are some important parallels between fascism, like for example. If we are to talk about this new wave of reactionary nationalism as a kind of neo-fascism, mm -hmm. I think one of the big differences, for example, is they don't aim for total ideological domination. No, right? they don't. They, 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 on one hand, they seek to continuously demonize a certain wing of politics, but also it doesn't want to utterly destroy them because the constant struggle against the libs and the socialists is like, necessary for survival and it's a fucking lot easier just to rig the judiciary and permanently uh fragment and de demobilize your like opposition through dirty tricks than it is to like ban all the other political parties and impose like um like one party rule over the country and enforce ideological unity on the country instead you create an in-group and an out group and you 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 permanently beat up on the on the out group uh as like a fundamental process of pra uh, of politics uh and i think that has some parallels with historical fascism but it's also like something very much postmodern yeah and it's also not i think i think postmodern militant conservatism is actually or militant reactionaryism is actually a better way to frame it mm -hmm. um because um, there's another element of fascism that we that we drop out, which is there. It was aiming to be beyond left and right. Current reactionaryism does not aim to be beyond left and right. It aims no. to be right populism or post neoliberal or post libertarian, but not 
not like some synthesis of a new thing. Um, uh, I'm being asked what scholars I would tell people to read on fascism. I would say Kevin Passmore, uh, Zev Sternhall, and Enzo Traverso on this current round because Enzo Traverso calls all this post fascism. So that there's an, I, we do see that there's a relationship. We're not ex exculpating them from, you know, a, a relationship to this, hor this historical form, but we're also not saying they're the same thing. Um, because I think the other thing is, they kind of don't have mass politics in a coherent way either, at least not like mass party politics. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, you do see, like, the, I mean, like, on one hand, like in Turkey, you know, the, a lot of people describe, a lot of people on the left in Turkey describe the Turkish, uh, you know, Erdogan and the IKP as fascist. Although I will say the Turkish left has vacillated between capitulating to Kemalism as being revolutionary and calling it fascism as well. So fascism, yeah. the F word gets thrown around quite a bit. And of course the Iranian left often talks about clerical fascism. I know that was like a popular term on the right during the war on terror, but like, you know, no, they people, said Islamic fascism, but yes. Islamo, yeah. So, so you had like clerical fascism uh, and terminologies like that. And there is a kind of mass politics in those countries, at least to a degree that maybe the British Conservative Party is not a fascist party, right? Um, so well, there what are... What about like Victor Urban's party? That does seem close to closer to traditional fascism. Yeah, that's, again, but again, it seems more in that model where where the objective is to like demoralize the opposition. Demoralize but, and demonize them, but not yeah. actually destroy them. And not, right? you don't get, you don't get to the eliminationist thing. And there's always a kind of weird dialectic. And you see it in Turkish politics, right? The the Turkish, the, the uh, I can't remember who it was, but uh, there was a, a Selim Kuru wrote an article in which he talked about like the Schmittian sort of basis of Turkish politics. But you have like AKP, they're like the they're like the nation, and then you have like the JHP, the opposition party, and then you have the HDP, and like basically they keep it together by like attempting to eliminate the HDP. And the left and like the far left, but then they allow this like big opposition to r hang around and constantly like is demoralized, being torn between having to rally around the nationalism of the of the ruling party and trying to simultaneously oppose uh, the ruling party, but they're just totally feckless at doing it because they can never really break with it, lest they get dumped into the you're going to get like liquidated wing of wing of politics so it's like a very uh you know a very um uh clerical for islamic fascism and clerical fashion is uh i want to just say in the in, in the comments was used by uh a lot of people in the west but it's like comes out of the political vo vocabulary not just of the iranian left lots of middle eastern lefts because you know, Islamism isn't a big deal in the West, but it can, it's a big deal if you're, if you're a Middle Eastern leftist. Uh, yeah, Israeli, the Israelis used it too, right? But like a lot of leftists have used it for a long time. A lot of leftists have conceptualized uh, the rise of like popular Islamic movements as fascism, which I don't agree. That's a really good uh, definition of them. But, you know, I can see why that, I can see why they look at it that way. Uh, Someone's asking me, does Kamalism have any have much popular support at this point? It's hard to say, actually. When I was in, when I was in uh, Istanbul about four years ago, Kamalism has seemed to have merged with liberalism. But there were still a lot of there were still a lot of people when I was in like Selçuk and like rural in quotation marks Turkey that were like that were beating off to Erdogan, but they still had all those Ataturk pictures like in their vans so, so it's, it's super complicated because like there's a there's a former fascist like proper fascist like a gray wolf uh like boss uh, uh guy called taha akil his son mustafa akil is actually like a, he's now a fellow at the cato institute and is like a libertarian he's okay. a libert he's a libertarian muslim who like muslims for markets and stuff like that but this guy Taha Akio wrote a very astute book called Hangi Ataturk, Witch Ataturk.
And his basic argument is that like Atatürk is a kind of protean figure in Turkish political culture because there's different phases of the Kemalist project. So there was the phase in which Mustafa Kemal was like fighting against the imperialists to, to rescue the Ottoman Empire. And then, of course, there's the post-1924, 1925 Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who was this kind of like high Europeanizing modernist. So like different wings of American pol uh, of Turkish politics can appropriate Mustafa Kemal's image. Uh, for their different purposes, and you can actually tell the political orientation of, of of the person by what kind of Mustafa Kemal picture they have. Is it Mustafa Kemal in his Western garb as a president, or is Mustafa Kemal with his kalpak, which is a lambskin hat dressed in the military uniform? It was kalpak, so I yeah, yeah, it's kalpak, baby. It's the kalpak, baby. He was like he's the guy fighting to rescue the caliph. Now, in terms of high Kemalism, which is like the modernizing, westernizing project, it is, it's basically an attempt to trans, you know, it's not a rejection of Islam. Islam is never rejected by Kemalism in its entirety. It's the attempt to nationalize Islam as a national religion, to create a Turkish Islam that is kind of secularized, secularized. Like, for example, people will drink alcohol, but, you know, on Ramadan, they won't drink alcohol. You know, because right. they'll fast and they, they will take a month off from having booze. So like, um, so Kamalism, that Kamalist, high Kamalist political project, which, you know, uh, basically has support in certain parts of the country, in Western Anatolia, on the Aegean coast, and among certain social classes, teachers, or at least the older generation of teachers, state functionaries, at least the older generation of state functionaries, the military, at least the older generation of the military, and and then a lot of young people who are liberals, but are still like symbolically kind of like they get a they get a hard on for Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. They're like, you know, they probably wouldn't like Mustafa Kemal Ataturk's actual politics but they like to posture social democratic or liberal but they also like turkish nationalism so kemalism is kind of a, it has it's like the second fucking ideology in turkey right mm -hmm. uh like erdogan's been very successful in mobilizing like discontent at kemalism but he's never rejected the kemalist uh project in its entirety and there's still a kind of like educated pmc wing of turkish society that really digs uh Kemalism and ultimately Kemalism is the big reason that you like fighting the RKP is so ineffectual because you know if you're the Kemalists and we had uh, Jihan Turgul on This Is Revolution a, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, it's like made the point. It's like these guys have no plan for the country. It's just like you know we'll do the same wars as Erdogan does. We'll we'll do the same like imp you know like military adventurism. We'll just do it better. We'll do the same neoliberalism as maybe with like slightly better welfare than the RKP and we'll be like less corrupt. There's no actually project change. And, oh, and we'll, and you, uh, uh, you know, you'll, uh, people, people will basically, um, you know, like us because we're doing Turkish nationalism better than the RKP. And also we dress in Western styles and we aren't so fucking, because what people got to understand as well, there's a kind of class issue, a class slash geographical issue taking place here. It's like these motherfuckers didn't want women with headscarves going into the u university, right? Partly because of Islamism, you know, partly because of religion, partly also because it's like that's some low class shit, right? Uh, you know, like these guys are like fucking fresh off the boat from Anatolia. They're from Tashra, which is like, um, you know, like the bumpkins from, from the like, yokel country. And they're coming in with their clothing, their food, their styles, which is kind of embarrassing to us because we we like to think of ourselves as more like in tune with the fucking Italians and the fucking Spanish. We're more like a Mediterranean people. So um, you're the cool Byzantine Muslims. Yeah, like they're, they're like very nationalist. They're, they're, they're like it's like super weird. They're like there's there's also like a huge fetishism for like the pre-Islamic Turkish past and like. With the descendants of fucking Asana, the like mythical wolf, so it's like it's really it's really fucking it's it's like a kind of like the problem in Turkey is fundamentally both the main opposition and the governing party are Turkish nationalists, 
They have different symbolic resources that they rely on to b construct their notion of Turkish nationhood. Uh, but at the end of the day, they don't offer anything different. And both wings of politics like offer a kind of neoliberalism and an authoritarian neoliberalism. I mean, like, People like, you know, like the IKP, though, like were able to use neoliberalism with a kind of Clintonian welfareism to like consolidate their base, which is fucking genius, man. Uh, abs absolute fucking genius. And oh, look, oh, look who's in the chat. Absolute faint demon is in the chat. Yeah. Uh, here's some questions. Okay, let me check these questions. All right. Um, are there any hips or bougie curds that are really in the Saladin? <laughs> Yeah, there's some, no actually like, Saladin's controversial amongst Kurds because like people are like ah oh, fuck Saladin he didn't like help out Kurds he was too busy trying to help all the Muslims, but like Islamist Kurds they like Saladin right, and when like when Arabs and Turks are trying to do the whole hey we're all Muslims let's like stick it to let's stick it to the Crusaders they'll go talk about Saladin and and stuff like that. Um, What's his name? Besiktas? Yeah, it's real. Besiktas is real deal. At least it was last time I was in Turkey. Do I agree with Abdullah Öcalan's idea that the state being a tool of capitalism? Does... I mean, like, I think Abdullah Öcalan is like, really overrated as a fucking political philosopher. Like, you know, like, it's not, it's going to be controversial in me saying this in the, uh, to, but I don't think there's too many Kurdish people here. Kind of mm -hmm. think a lot of it's kind of, it's kind of like obscurantist bullshit, you know, like the, you know, I like the decentralization stuff. I like the women's rights stuff, but it's nothing fucking mind blowing. It's just, it's just some fucking lefty, like the Turkish word is boshyazman, like the fucking empty writing, kind of bores me. So I'm not a big Erdogan fan, but you know, fan, but whatever. Young Turks, Ataturk ruined Turkey forever. Ataturk was a young Turk, basically, or at least like everybody who followed. There's like the Young Turks and the Kemalist era. It's just, if you read Eric. Jan Zürcher, it's the it's a continuation of the same period. Oh man, talking about Öcalan for half an hour. Let me tell you about Öcalan. Öcalan is like kind of like a Maoist, like hardcore authoritarian Maoist who ran the PKK with an iron fist and basically liquidated any like successful front commander. He also absolutely fucking botched the war by like attempting to set up liberation liberated zones and then inviting like a kind of pseudo parliament to come and make laws and they all got fucking screwed. Uh, like he was like a fucking bad leader. Uh, and like, uh, but then he got fucking captured, right? He like, basically the Syrians were like, look buddy, Turkey's gonna invade. Cause basically the PKK began by fighting a war against war against uh like the feudal collaborating class which i don't have a problem with but then they also started fucking shooting the shit out of like any other like left-wing kurdish political party there was uh accusing them of them, them being reformist because like parties like the kurdistan socialist party only asked for autonomy and the pkk were like no we wanted a united independent kurdistan made out of all parts of kurdistan then after the 1980 coup, they all fucked off to Syria. And suddenly Syria and Kurdistan did not, was not Kurdistan anymore. So they were like, no, no, Syria and Kurdistan is not made up, is not an integral part of Kurdistan. So basically they worked with the Syrian government. The Syrian government allowed Kurds in Syria to join the PKK rather than the Syrian army. And uh, they fought this big war and they did a lot of fucking fighting. It was brutal. They, they you know, like the Turkish state was extremely dirty. They use Islamists to attack them, but also the PKK like engaged like in a heavy degree of violence, so much so that the PKK actually had to change its political strategies because it was pissing off the Kurdish pe peasantry that was primed by the brutalization of the Turkish state to, to fight. Them. Anyway, the, the, the war ended up with like this, the Turkish state just going full ham and just evacuating and destroying villages across uh, Kurdistan to like starve the PKK. And Erdogan, like the Syrians told him to get the fuck out of Syria. He ran off, like the Greeks were hiding him. Mossad and the CIA helped Turkish intelligence capture him. And then in, in, in once in captivity, like Erdogan became, his, like it's really amazing to watch the fucking uh, transformation of Erdogan's image to like this Gandhi like Nelson Mandela guy when it's like bro throughout the 90s this guy was like hardcore read at least if you want to read something in English Elisa Marcos has a book called um, Blood and Belief about the PKK which is it's you know a lot of people in the PKK are like look you know 
for all its problems, the PKK put the Kurdish question on the map, and that is undeniable, right? Undeniable. But Erdogan's leadership, uh, I got like some issues with that. Um, and like, there's a lot of anarchists out here who are like uh, thinking Erdogan's like some kind of fucking mega philosopher. He basically calling for like having a decentralized state, which is great. I like decentralization. I like municipalities. I like all this, this, but it's just with a whole load of like fancy pants language. I'm not super impressed by it. So whatever. Kind of like so, Nagiri and his populist autonomism, right? Like it was fancy pants language. It's but. like fancy pants language for saying like, let's do everything through co-ops. Let's give women AK-47s and we'll solve the gender issue that way, which actually is like a very effective way to s s solve solve sexual discrimination. Just fucking just give give a bunch of 19 year olds military training. We all may be born equal, but Smith and Wesson makes it so. Exactly. <laughs> um. So, yeah, like so. So, like, I'm not a I'm not a big Ojalan like fan fanboy. I think like. I just think like he has a huge cult of personality and I think that's kind of detrimental to the Kurdish movement. And, you know, I get why there's a huge, like I remember a very good friend of mine, a uh, Kurd from Turkey, like very smart guy. He was like, look, bro, we needed Erjelan as a big cult because there was this huge Ataturk cult uh, in Turkey that was being propagated. We had to build our own cult as big as that cult to like, you know, like counter that cult. Right. But like, oh my God, like, you know, people think that like uh, everybody in fucking Rojava is talking about Murray Bookchin. Nobody's fucking talking about Murray Bookchin. Nobody gives a shit about Murray Bookchin. Everybody likes fucking uh, Abdullah Jalan, the greatest thinker of the fucking 21st century, right? That's, that's who people are into. Now, do I think the PKK, like, you know, as someone of Kurdish origins, I've got respect for those guys for fighting for Kurdish rights. You know, I've got, I've got respect for them. I don't have to fucking sign, and uh, you know, I don't have to sign on to their whole fucking Ojalan cult. I don't want to have to sign on to. I think Ojalan should be released from prison. Uh, I think like there should be a peace process. Uh, but ultimately, the Kurdish movement's totally fucked. Uh, I went to a conference the, the other day. There was like some pro PK, PK people there. They're talking all kinds of shit. And I was like, bro, like listen up. The only success. Kurds have had success in the last 20. They were like, oh, yeah, we had this success in the last 40 years. I was like, motherfuckers, you had success in the last 40 years, 30, 30 years, 20, 30 years, simply because of two factors, geopolitics and imperialist intervention, right? Uh, Kurds struggled for like fucking 70 years and got fucking gassed and bombed. But the collapse of the Iraqi and then the Syrian state created a space where Kurds could breathe for a little bit. And those state projects only survive because of the geopolitics of the region, not just the United States, but a whole other host of fact, uh, factors. The only surefire solution for the Kurdish uh, uh, question is revolution in Turkey, uh, at very least Turkey. Uh, and uh, like there has to be like Kurds can't, Kurds do not have the power in and of themselves to change their circumstances because of the geo, uh, geopolitical iron cage. Van, you were talking with um, uh, Cuba, and you you talking about Poland, and one of the critical points which uh, uh, that you guys talked about was like Polish independence after the First World War was brought about by like a unique set of circumstances, which was the simultaneous collapse of state power in all three yeah. partitioning countries. Kurdistan is partitioned by four made four countries. We've had the complete state collapse in two of those countries but there are two still fucking giant countries that still like have an interest of making sure that there's no kurdish independence right from turkish perspective iraqi kurdish independence would be great economically they would basically get control of the kerkuk oil kurdistan would be a colony but they don't want to fucking set the precedent for their own kurdish population to aspire to statehood uh, so keeping iraqi kurdistan as a kind of autonomous uh, state uh, that like is reliant on Turkey. Turkey is like a method. Uh, and they of don't want to do. Why don't they consider like uh, population transfers like they did in the beginning of the 20th century with the Greeks? I mean, it, 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 it's too many Kurds in Turkey, man. There's fucking tons. Like, there's like nobody Got knows. It. 
there's nobody knows how many Kurds there are in Turkey because they don't keep those numbers. This is why, I mean, I got I got fucking blocked by uh, Isha, uh, basically for telling her that like the maps which tell you the ethnic origin of like the the like like the ethnic breakdown of different regions are kind of like inaccurate because nobody has accurate data because states don't fucking collect the data of what people's ethnic identity are. The closest you'll get is mother tongue. And if you're like in the Syrian Arab Republic and you maybe speak three words of Arabic, are you just going to tell the census guy you speak fucking Arabic, right? So yeah, like I have some fucking, I have some, what about the MEK, MEK are fucking nutcases? It's a cult. Once told me called Hezbollah to help them instead of the USA. Yeah, oh, Hezbollah, fucking, uh, Isher's fucking, uh, Isher is like, uh, she's a corporate lawyer, man. Like she's fucking like, like a lot of these people, she's, she's always like accusing people of being this, that, and the other. It's like, bro, you're a fucking corporate lawyer. Shut Isha, up. Isha, the person who also celebrates like, like Lysenkoism online. Like, about... I don't know if she celebrates Lysenkoism, but she's like a big Stalin guy. Yeah. She's, made, she's yeah, she had... athlete is it. K, Isha K. Yeah. Uh, I she... would prefer we not talk about Twitter drama, but yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, I have ran into her for a different issue. Nothing to do with Kurdistan. Everything to do with um, with uh, her promoting Lysenkoism and, and like talking about how Ukrainians are epigenetically racist. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 uh, like let's not talk about her. Like, it's, let's not single anyone out. But there is a weird woke Stalinism, which is like the fucking weirdest shit ever. It's like, bro, like there's these people with like trans disabled. Stalinist. It's like, bro, what are you doing? Like those guys, like, like they literally like. If, nobody ever replies to the fucking points you make about like when you're criticizing Stalin. It's like, look, bro, like, uh, like the laws were changed in the Soviet Union to like outlaw homosexuality, and homosexuality was presented as bourgeois deviance, right? Like, how are you going to defend that? You know, like, what's your defense of that? It's, uh, it's fucking nuts. Anyway, um, we got one more question, and then we're gonna call it quits for tonight. Um, question for Gene: I recall the 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 Palestinian episode of you and I and Kuba did way back. Um, on the other two about Palestinians accepting the feet or the process of ethnic cleansing will succeed. How Kurds exist from this logic, given uh, at this time, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it depends which Kurds we're talking about, right? The Kurds of Iran and Turkey are pretty fucked, right? In Iraq, they're in a pretty strong position because the Iraqi state has kind of become a consociational state dominated by sectarian and ethnic elites. So like the Kurds are like a key player in the kind of like politics. They like that their, their autonomy is like institutionalized to such an extent that the Iraqi state is not, I can't foresee them like overturning that autonomy, right? It's just it just doesn't seem plausible. Even when the Kurds and the Iraqi state went to war and uh, over, uh, went to war with each other in two, uh, 2017 over the Kurdish independence referendum, the only territories that the Iraqi state like reasserted control over were the disputed territories that you know Kurds and the central government dispute. They didn't go into the Kurdish like the officially recognized Kurdish autonomous region. And the Kurdish po political actors they have all kinds of alliances with Shia, certain Sunni groups, and everybody's always like playing off one another in order to get a slice of the Iraqi state. The so Iraqi Kurds like they're not really nationally oppressed anymore. There isn't like a issue of national oppression, at least within the KRG and the disputed territories, it's a bit different, but there isn't an issue of national, like a core issue of a national oppression uh, in, in Iraq Kurdistan. I think they're like pretty much, pretty much like kind of like baked in. Uh, in Syria, it's a bit different because like Syria exists at the pleasure of the inter-imperialist rivalries that dominate the Syrian civil war. But so far again, they're in like a reasonably strong position so long as Turkey isn't allowed to attack them. But if you're in Turkey and, uh, and Iran, like in Turkey, they're basically going around liquidating like the political and constitutional wing of the Kurdish movement and then fighting a war of extermination against the PKK. So currently operations being fought across Iraqi Kurdistan to like w try and wipe out the PKK 
uh, this time it looks like they're going to be looks like they're going to there's a chance they it might go full Tamil Tigers and they'll just get wiped out right cuz you know like the mountains are hard to fight in but historic but you know now you've got drone technologies the Turks can build like better drones and things like that so they might they might end up fucking pulling a bit of it. and Iran the Iranian fucking political system is moribund like Iran is like completely fucked up on one hand, you've got sanctions, and one uh, on the other hand, you've got like a vampiric a clerical uh, elite and their allies that is like sucking up. Like, if you have sanctions on your country, if you're part of the elite, you can get dollars and access to like foreign currency at like a discounted rate. And so, as everybody's desperate, guess what you do? You use your fucking connections, you get foreign currency, and then you buy out everybody in the middle class. So you have like a growing concentration of wealth into a smaller and smaller elite in, in Iranian society. So it's like kind of fucked up, man. All right. So two more questions that I think are perfect. Then I'm really going to stop questions. So people quit asking them. Um, how about the water rights between Turkey and Iraq, Syria, destruction of, uh, of dams in Turkey are a matter of life and death. It's big. It's seriously fucked up, man. Like uh, part of the Syrian civil war and a lot of the problems that are taking place in Iraq are like to do with like the Tigris and Euphrates getting dammed, and the like the 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 marshes, the marshes in the south of Iraq. There was attempts after the Iraq War to like you know rebuild the marshlands. It's totally fucked up because of like the uh, Turkey's damming more and more uh, of, of the Tigris and Euphrates source rivers, and basically they can control the flow of water and it's not just uh, turkey like iran is also damming tributaries uh to to the river system in iraq so like you're seeing creeping desertification you know the agricultural base of the country people forget this iraq was like a fucking highly productive agricultural center the first agricultural civilization in human history was 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 in iraq but it's being to totally annihilated and one of the big causes of the syrian civil war is the environmental change taking in place in Syria and the huge droughts that are exacerbated by the damming process. I mean, I'm not an expert on the environmental issues, but it's pretty fucking serious. And the last question, um, thoughts on delisting the PKK. I listened to a cosmonaut podcast with a foreign volunteer and they said that was the only thing to do now, really. I mean, sure. Delist the PKK, of course. Like, you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, why not? I mean, Turkey won't be happy about it. Most PK, it's not really good. It's going to help people out in Europe. You know, like, if you want to look at it from a bourgeois perspective, you know, the best hope is for some kind of mediation between Turkey and the PKK, but I don't think, I don't think Turkey, Turkey doesn't, Turkey doesn't want to make peace with the PKK, right? Like, there was a time where the AKP wanted to make peace with PKK, for like the opportunistic electoral re reasons, but as soon as the the electoral logic for that evaporated, they could do to, did a vault fast, you know, because the AKP are like the ultimate protein postmodern conservatives. They'll fucking change whatever. Like they were all allying, posturing pro Kurdish, and then when it looked like the Kurdish party was going to like deny them a parliamentary majority, they shifted their base of support to the ultra nationalists, and it's like a uh, fucking. Uh, messed up. Uh, Istanbul Canal is a stupid fucking project because the AKP is running out of ideas and they need big ideas. It's like that stupid second Suez Canal, right? Are they doing that? Do you know about that, Vaughn? The second Suez Canal? I don't think they're doing it. I mean, the, the, the Egypt lost so much money on the expansion of the last Suez Canal um, uh, when global shipping changed because when they raised the prices on the on, on canal passage to pay for the expansion of the canal, it literally became cheaper due to cheap gas prices to go around the Horn of Africa. So, you know, it was, it's probably not. I, it's my, my, my short answer is unless gas prices get a lot more expensive, probably not. They're probably yeah. going to take a Suez Canal. I mean, there, yeah. there's been so many Egyptian developmental projects that I've heard, you know, such as like Al Sisi building a new capital city in the middle of the desert. Uh, off of Chinese money, you know, um, that I have seen no fulfillment of from people in Egypt. Um, admittedly, I haven't been keeping up as much as I, as I used to. Like, you know, I missed that Morsi died uh, recently, um, in, you know, under from illness in prison. But, um, but yeah. Uh, thanks for coming on, Gene. We're going to schedule you formally sometime in the next couple months. And Gene and I are always going to be uh, we, we actually are 
constantly uh, talking about the expanded TIR zero universe, um, which is increasingly more the TIR universe than the zero universe. But um, uh, and uh, this our gaming stream will be part of that, and we are going to talk about the political economy of these games as well as all the cool, cool fun stuff too. Yeah. Um, I hope this, I hope that, I hope there will be some interest and I hope we will. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it and I hope we can get our guests for the second episode. I'm going to email them tomorrow. Sweet, sweet, sweet. I I'm, I'm looking forward to particularly that one. Um, all right. Uh, thanks Gene for coming on really spur of the moment. We both been on pods for i literally finished the pod tar was on i'm like oh i'm gonna watch tar because you know my partner's out doing something political tonight and then i was like i need to go respond to this these ideas in my head and then you're on now and it's probably like way late where you're at so yeah I'll, i i guess i'm gonna uh i'm gonna I'm probably gonna watch some some questing beast videos and go to sleep all right all right take care bye bye